ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it is for me a very great happiness to be back in Amsterdam. It's a city I know well, uh, it's a country I know very well, and I express my deep thanks to the organizers for extending this invitation to the Dutch Auschwitz Committee, to the NIOD Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and the Social Insurance Bank. And I express, too, my deep personal appreciation to those associated with the Annette Fels Kupfer Schmidt uh, Award. Uh, I thank also those who have spoken very generously, uh, including uh, Professor Shriver with the Laudatio. Uh, I have to say, just as a personal note, before I begin the formal part of the lecture, um, uh, in conversation before with a colleague, I was reminded uh, of the first time I came to Amsterdam. I was 18 years old. It was the summer of 1979, and uh, I was with three friends. We were in that summer between school and university, and we bought ourselves an old Ford Transit van which we kitted up with beds and a shower. And it was our summer plan to drive around Europe, and our first stop was Amsterdam. And we spent a day enjoying the city. I think we went to the Anne Frank house, uh, and then we went and had dinner, and then we went to bed in our Ford Transit. And at about three o'clock in the morning, there was a knock on the door, and it was a Dutch policeman who uh, arrested us. Uh, <laughs> because we uh, did not realize it was prohibited to sleep in your Ford Transit van <laughs> overnight. I think we were let off with a caution, uh, but that was my first introduction uh, to this fantastic city and this fantastic country. I come back a lot. I'm very active in cases before courts uh, in The Hague, and I've probably come uh, on average about 10 times a year. So it touches me very deeply uh, to be here uh, today. We are here today as a group, but one that shares a singular commitment, Auschwitz never again. As a group, we are nevertheless, each of us, also individuals. And long ago, I came to understand that my own various activities, teaching, writing, litigating, are activities that are informed by my background by baggage that was attached to me when I entered the world as each of us enters this world with baggage. We are not blank slates. In his wonderful autobiography, Interesting Times, the historian Eric, Hobbs, Eric Hobsbawm recognized the complex connection between who we are and what we do. He wrote about the profound way in which the interweaving of one person's life and times and the observation of those life and times help to shape our sense of historical analysis. I'm not uh, a historian, uh, I'm a lawyer, but I do focus on things that are international and my professional and academic interest is really a desire to understand how the law functions, how rules come into being, how are they interpreted and applied? How do they affect the behavior of different actors, states, individuals, corporations? My curiosity about a person's life and times concerns the way it might inform the world and the experience of the past quarter of a century of my work, often here in the Netherlands, not least in the courtrooms of The Hague, appearing before international judges from so many different backgrounds, points to me to a rather clear conclusion. Individual lives and personal histories really matter, and they really can make a difference. My book, East West Street, on the origins of genocide and crimes against humanity, took never, nearly seven years to write. It isn't about the life of one person, but four individuals, and it seeks to understand how the particular circumstances of each of those individuals contributed to the roads he took, and how the different roads thus traveled changed the system of international law that is my daily work. As many of you will know, the book also touches on a much more personal theme, how these four interweaving lives 
influenced the path that I've taken, directly or indirectly? And below that question lurk some much, much bigger questions that touch each and every one of us in this room today. They address central questions of human identity. Who am I? And how do I wish to be defined? As an individual, or as a member of a group, or more, one or more groups, or both? And how do we want the law to protect us? As individuals, or because we are members of protected groups? Those questions are as pertinent today as they were when the legal concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide were coined back in 1945, and then in December 1948, when the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide were signed in Paris. East West Street came about by chance, like so much in life. It was the spring of 2010. I was immersed in my world of classrooms at UCL, academic articles, cases in The Hague. An invitation arrived from the Ukraine, an email from the law faculty of a university in a city that was once called Lemberg during the Austria-Hungarian Empire until 1918, then Lwów during the Polish period until 1939, and then Lviv after 1945. Would I come to Lviv and deliver a public lecture on my work and cases on crimes against humanity and genocide, the email asked, about the cases in which I've been involved and about my work on the Nuremberg trial and the trial's consequences for modern international law and our world today. Yes, I said, I'd be delighted to come. I'd long been fascinated by the trial of Nuremberg, by the myths of Nuremberg, the words, the images, the sounds. The trial was truly catalytic. It was the moment when our modern system of international justice, such as it is, crystallized into being. And I was mesmerized by odd points of detail to be found in the lengthy transcripts, the terrible evidence. I was drawn to the books and the memoirs and the diaries that described in forensic detail the testimony before the judges, but also the love affairs that went on behind the scenes. I was drawn to films like Judgment at Nuremberg, which won an Oscar in 1961, made so memorable by Spencer Tracy's momentary unexpected flirtation with Marlena Dietrich and the line from his closing judgment. We stand for truth, justice, and the value of a single human life. But there was also a practical aspect to my interest because the trial's influence on my work had been profound. The Nuremberg judgment blew a powerful wind into the sails of a germinal human rights movement. Sure, there was a certain whiff of victor's justice, but there was no doubt that the case was catalytic and that it opened the possibility that the leader, leaders of a country could be put on trial before an international court or tribunal. That had never happened before in human history. It must have been my work as a barrister, I suspect, rather than my writings that caused the invitation to be sent from Lviv. As Professor Shriver mentioned, in the summer of 98, I'd been involved in Rome, peripherally in the drafting of the Statute of the International Criminal Court, a court which would have jurisdiction both over genocide and crimes against humanity, as well as two other crimes. The essential difference, and it's important to understand, between the two concepts is on who is protected and why. Assume that 10,000 people are killed, murdered, exterminated. The systematic killing of human beings in such numbers as individuals will always be a crime against humanity. But will it be a genocide? That depends in law on the intentions of the killers and the ability of prosecutors to prove that intention. To establish the crime of genocide, you have to show that the act of killing is motivated by a special intent, the intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. 
if a criminal prosecutor cannot prove that large numbers of people have been killed with that intent, then the crime of genocide under international law is not established. And so you have these two concepts operating side by side and overlapping. Every genocide will also be a crime against humanity, but not every crime against humanity will be a genocide. A few months after both crimes were inscribed into the statute of the International Criminal Court, Senator Pinochet was arrested in London on charges of genocide and crimes against humanity, laid against him by a Spanish prosecutor. The House of Lords, the highest court, ruled that even as a former president of Chile, he was not entitled to claim immunity from the English courts. That was a novel and revolutionary judgment. In the years that followed, the gates of international justice slowly began to creak open, 50 years after the Nuremberg judgment, a period of quiescence during the Cold War chill that followed the trial. Cases landed on my desk, as has been described. And these were always based on new rules that came into being after 1945, that revolutionary moment when it was recognized for the first time in human history that the rights of the sovereign over its people were not unlimited under international law. The long and sad list of cases that reached me reflected, as has been mentioned, a failure of good intentions in courtroom 600 of Nuremberg's Palace of Justice. I became involved in too many cases that involved mass killings. I have seen many mass graves. Some of those cases raised claims of crimes against humanity, the killing of individuals on a large scale. Others gave rise to allegations of genocide, the destruction of groups. These two distinct crimes, with their different emphases on the individual and the group, grew side by side. Although over time, genocide seems to have emerged in the eyes of many as the crime of crimes a hierarchy that somehow leaves the unfortunate suggestion that the killing of large numbers of human beings as individuals is somehow less terrible. Occasionally, I'd pick up hints about the origins and purposes of the two terms and the connection of the arguments that were first made in courtroom 600 in November 1945. But I never really inquired too deeply as to what exactly had happened at Nuremberg. I knew generally how these new crimes had come into being and how they subsequently developed, but I didn't know about the personal stories behind them, as I've learned from being in international courtrooms and now sitting as an international arbitrator. Personal stories really matter. I didn't know how they were argued at Nuremberg. And so the invitation from Lviv gave me a chance to research, to explore that history. Now, I could say that I made the trip to Lviv to give a lecture, but that would not be accurate. I actually traveled for another reason, this young man, who was my grandfather, Leon Buchholz, aged 10. He was born in Lemberg in 1904. He called it Lemberg when he spoke in German, Lvov when he spoke in Polish. In his wonderful slim volume, Moi Lvov, written in 1946, available now in English, published by Pushkin Press, as City of Lions. The wonderful Polish poet Joseph Wittlin describes the essence of being a Lvovian. It is, he wrote, an extraordinary mixture of nobility and roguery, of wisdom and imbecility, of poetry and vulgarity. But, he added, Nostalgia likes to falsify the flavors, telling us to taste nothing but the sweetness of Lvov today. I know people, Vitlin concluded, for whom Lvov was a cup of gall. And it was a cup of gall for my grandfather. Buried deep, part of a hinterland of experience of which he never spoke to me, Lviv, Lemberg, was a time of silence 
barely covering the wounds of a family that he left behind in 1914 when he moved to Vienna when the Russians occupied the city and then lost forever after 1939 when he moved from Vienna to Paris. But the moment I set foot in that city in the autumn of 2010, it felt strangely familiar, sort of like a long lost relative. The dark city was somehow part of my DNA. I'd missed it. I felt immediately comfortable there, and I have on the many occasions that I've been back. Why I had that reaction caused me to explore psychoanalytical writings that address the relationship not between parent and child, between grandparent and grandchild. And I was directed to the works of two Hungarian psychoanalysts, Maria Torok and Nicholas Abraham. What haunts, they wrote, are the gaps left within us by the secrets of others. And those are the words with which East West Street opens. And my grandfather Leon's secret was that he actually came from a huge family, one that was centered in Lemberg and its environs, literally dozens of uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews, and more distant relatives. The family grew and grew until 1939 when war came to the city. And within six years, by 1945, he was the only member of that family still alive, the only survivor from the city and Galicia. In 1939, based in Vienna, he was banished from that city, defined because of his religious affiliation. He was Jewish. He went to Paris, and that's where he was when I knew him many years later. Amongst his papers, long after his death, I found the actual expulsion order. Translated into English, it says, the Jew, Buchholz, Maurice Leon, is required to leave the territory of the German Reich by December the 25th, 1938. The reason he could be expelled was that he had been made stateless. And that's one of the reasons, no doubt, that I feel as strongly as I do about the current fad in some countries, including the United Kingdom, to strip certain people of their nationality. One thing always leads to another. I had always assumed that Leon had left Vienna with his wife, Rita, my grandmother, and his one-year-old daughter, Ruth, my mother. But in the course of my research, I learned that this was not the case. And it was this central fact, something that had happened in Vienna in 1938-39, which lay deep, which touched my family and my childhood, a childhood of deep silences. Leon left Vienna and made his way to Paris by himself. Only now, gaining access for the first time to his personal papers, as I prepared that lecture I was going to give in Lviv, did I learn that his daughter had traveled to Paris a few months later and that his wife remained in Vienna for another three years. From this material, I formed the sense that something else must have intervened in their lives before the three separated in January 1939. Why did Leon leave Vienna on his own? How on earth did my mother, Ruth, get from Vienna to Paris by herself as an infant of less than a year? And most pressingly, why did Rita remain in Vienna, allowing herself to be separated from her only child? These are big questions, and they hung in the air as such questions tend to hang. I return to the documents found amongst Leon's papers looking for clues. I'm a litigator, which is a sort of lesser amateur historian come psychiatrist. And you learn from every piece of paper or photograph that it is capable of holding information that is not immediately knowable. It's the muck of evidence, and I love it. I've learned if you look carefully, if you keep an open mind, if you confront what is unexpected, if you find the dots, try to join them, if you persist, you might come to some sort of a truth. And nothing is ever quite what it seems. Two items stood out. This is the first one. 
a tiny scrap of thin yellow paper. It was folded in half. One side was blank. The other bore a name and address written firmly in pencil. The writing was angular and strong. Miss E. M. Tilney, Manuka, Bluebell Road, Norwich, Angleterre. The second item was a small black and white photograph taken in 1949, not quite square, a middle-aged man staring intently into camera. Faint smile across the lips, he wears a pinstripe suit, a white handkerchief neatly folded into his breast pocket. His polka dot bow tie emphasizes a sort of slightly mischievous air. On the back of the photograph, in blue ink, was written, Herzliche Grüße aus Wien, September 1949. Warmest wishes from Vienna. It was a signature, but it was indecipherable. When I first saw these items, I asked my mother what they were. She said they didn't know. She didn't know, but I didn't really believe her. The scraps were retained. I wondered whether they might shed some light on what had happened to my grandfather in 1939. I pinned them on the wall above my desk where they would remain for several years and turned to the lecture that I had to write for Lviv. I've taken you off on a little personal detour, but you'll recall that the lecture in Lviv was about the origins of crimes against humanity and genocide. And there then began a series of remarkable coincidences. In preparing the lecture back in the summer of 2010, I was immensely surprised to learn that the man who put the concept of crimes against humanity into international law actually came from Lviv. Indeed, he was a student at the very university that had invited me to give the lecture, but no one there was aware of that fact. His name was Hirsch Lauterpacht. He was born in the small town of Zhulkiev, about 15 miles north of Lviv. He moved to the bigger city when he was 14 and enrolled at the university law faculty four years later. In 1919, he moved to Vienna, where he spent four years studying with Hans Kelsen. He came to London in 1923 with his new wife to study. He became a renowned academic, first at the London School of Economics, then at Cambridge University. In 1945, he published a book that laid the foundations for the modern system of human rights. He gave it the title, An International Bill of the Rights of Man, and it offered a revolutionary idea to recognize for the first time ever that every human being on the planet had rights under international law as an individual. He prepared 20 draft articles, which covered much that was new, but was by no means exhaustive. By more contemporary standards, notable omissions include any reference, for example, to the prohibition on torture, nothing in relation to discrimination against women. And equally striking was Lauterpak's approach to the situation, as he called it, of non-whites in South Africa. The thorny problem, he wrote, of actual disenfranchisement of large sections of the Negro population in some states of the United States. This was, frankly, a brutal recognition of real politique, necessary to allow those two countries, South Africa and the United States, to engage with his idea of an international bill. But the draft bill, he wrote, gave effect to his personal credo. The individual human being, he wrote, is the ultimate unit of all law. In April 1945, after the war in Europe ended, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin agreed that there would be a criminal trial for senior Nazi leaders. The British government hired Lauterpacht to help on the prosecution, to work with Robert Jackson, the chief prosecutor. In July 1945, Jackson traveled to London to draft the charter of the tribunal. The four powers, America, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, couldn't agree about the list of crimes over which the tribunal would exercise jurisdiction. Jackson turned to Lauterpacht for help. On July the 29th, 1945, Jackson was driven from his room at Claridge's Hotel in Mayfair to Cambridge to have lunch with the Lauterpacks. 
This is Hirsch Lauterpacht in the garden where he met Jackson. The two men discussed the problem of the list of international crimes. Lauterpacht suggested that it might be a good idea to insert titles into the text that would help public understanding and it would add legitimacy to the proceedings. Jackson reacted positively. So Lauterpacht offered a second idea. In respect of atrocities committed against civilians, a matter on which the Soviets and the Americans were deeply divided, Lauterpacht had a long-standing academic interest in the subject, his new book, and there was, of course, also a personal interest. He had no news at all about his family in Lemberg, his parents, brother and sister, a matter of which, as an emerging Englishman, he said nothing to Robert Jackson. Why not, he said, why not refer to the atrocities against individual civilians as crimes against humanity? Crimes against humanity. You can see the words here in Lauterpacht's own writing. The term would cover atrocities against individuals on a large scale, torture, murder, disappearance, and bring a new concept into international law. Never before had any instrument used that term. Jackson liked the idea, took it back to London, and a few days later it was incorporated into the Charter as Article 6, Paragraph C of the Statute. Clearly an innovation, Lauterpacht told the Foreign Office in London, but one that reflected an enlightened conception of the true purposes of the law of nations to protect individual human beings. A part of the law of mankind that signified that those who break international law cannot hide behind the law of their own country. Preparing the Lviv lecture required me also to focus on the parallel concept of genocide. This brings me to the second surprise for the man who invented that word in 1944 also came amazingly from Lviv and studied at the very same law school as Lauterpacht. And again, the folks who had invited me had no idea that he was from Lviv. His name was Raphael Lemkin. He arrived at Lviv University in 1921, two years after Lauterpacht had left, so they did not overlap, and remained there until 1926 when he obtained his doctorate in criminal law. After law school, he became a public prosecutor in Warsaw. In 1933, he wrote a paper for a League of Nations meeting in Madrid proposing new international crimes to combat barbarity and vandalism against people. His focus, however, was not on individuals like Lauterpacht. His focus was on the protection of groups, sometimes referred to as minorities. He, his ideas bounced around, but nothing came of them. The timing was hardly ideal. Hitler had just taken power in Germany. In 1939, when Germany invaded Poland, Lemkin was in Warsaw. He escaped, made his way to Sweden via his parents' town of Volkovysk, which was then under Soviet control. In 1941, he left Stockholm for America. As Europe was closed, he traveled the long route across the entirety of Russia to Japan and then by boat to Seattle, then by train to Durham, North Carolina, where he'd been offered a place of academic refuge at Duke University. On this journey, he traveled with no personal possessions and virtually no money, but a vast quantity of luggage. His luggage was filled with paper. He had collected thousands and thousands of decrees promulgated by the Nazis in the countries they had occupied over Europe, including the Netherlands. He'd gathered these materials and was now carting them three quarters of the way around the world. When he got to America, he analyzed the decrees and in 1942 obtained a contract to write a book that would describe the patterns of behavior he had found, indicia of an underlying master plan. The book was published in November 1944, called Axis Rule of Occupied Europe. Chapter nine of the book was given the title Genocide. Lemkin had invented a new word, the crime 
for the destruction of groups, a Nazi master plan, an amalgam of the Greek word genos, meaning tribe or race, and the Latin word sede. Here you can see it in his own hand. And most people are astonished that this word was invented as recently as 1944. The imagination is that it is a timeless word and a timeless concept. It is not. In the summer of 1945, Lemkin was hired by the US government to work on war crimes. And he started to work with Robert Jackson, although entirely separately from Hirsch Lauterpacht. He pushed his idea of genocide, a crime for which he wanted the senior Nazis to be indicted. In his view, the destruction of groups, Poles, Jews, Roma, was a matter for the Nuremberg Tribunal. It was the greatest of crimes. In August 1945, when the charter was adopted, following Jackson's visit to Lauterpacht in Cambridge, Lemkin was hugely disappointed that it included crimes against humanity, the killing of individuals, but was silent as to genocide and the killing of groups. He believed that the Nuremberg Statute should have addressed it. He flew himself to London. He worked on the indictment and was delighted when genocide made its way into the indictment against the individual defendants. He was persistent. He drove people slightly crazy. And there was strong opposition to the concept of genocide, in particular from Robert Jackson's office, under pressure from southern US senators who were concerned about discrimination against African Americans. And the British worried that the concept of genocide would be used in relation to their colonial legacy. Nevertheless, against the odds, Lemkin's word made it into the indictment. In early October, the four powers adopted a text that included his language under war crimes. The ill treatment and murder of civilians in Lemberg and Vulkovisk and many other areas. Like Lauterpacht, he had no news about the fate of his family. The indictment alleged that the Nazis conducted deliberate and systematic genocide. That text is the first time the word has ever been used in an international legal instrument, and it came with Lemkin's definition, the extermination of racial and religious groups. And it mentioned explicitly Jews, Poles, gypsies, and others. I went to London. I succeeded in having the charge of genocide against the Nazi war criminals in Nuremberg, Lemkin would later claim. The Nuremberg trial opened on the 20th of November, 1945. Lauterpacht was present in the courtroom with the British team pushing for the protection of individuals. Lemkin remained in Washington with the American team pushing for the protection of groups. One of the 22 men in the dock was Hans Frank. You can see him here on the screen, who becomes the fourth man in East West Street. He too was a lawyer, and from the late 1920s he served as Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer, an early supporter of the Nazi party. In 1933, he became Bavarian Minister of Justice, and two years later, at a conference of lawyers in Berlin, set out his credo. Community, he thundered, takes precedence over the individualistic, liberalistic, atomizing tendencies of the egoism of the individual. According to the record of the meeting, his words generated thunderous applause. In his case, such precedence of the community over the individual led to mass killing. In October 1939, he became governor general of Nazi-occupied Poland, and in August 1942, he visited Lemberg, Lviv, Lvov, recently incorporated into his territory as the capital of the province of Galicia. He hosted a concert in Lviv, which finished with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, and then gave a series of speeches in which he announced the elimination of the city's entire Jewish population. Amongst those who would be caught up in the horrors in the following weeks after Frank's visit were the families and friends and teachers of Lauterpacht and Lemkin, as well as the family of my grandfather, Leon. 
For each family, there'd be only a single survivor. Frank became the glue who connected the lives of the three men. I have to say, he didn't seem unduly perturbed by his actions, and he was more bothered by other mundanities. He lodged at the home of his deputy, Otto von Wechter, governor of Galicia, who is the principal character in the BBC radio and podcast series I have recently made. You can get it on the BBC website or on Apple. It's called The Rat Line, and it's the subject of the sequel to East West Street, which I'm just finishing right now. Otto Wechter was the closest friend and colleague of someone who will be very familiar to you, Arthur Seiss Ingvard. Dr. Schreiber mentioned my engagement with Otto Wechter's son, Horst. Horst's middle name is Arthur. He is the godson of Arthur Seiss Ingvard. The two families stayed together in Lemberg that day in August 1942, and Wechter's son, Horst, shared with me his mother's diary. I was able to read that Charlotte von Wechter played chess on the day that Frank announced the elimination of the Jewish population. I won two times, Charlotte wrote in her diary. After that, Frank went angrily to bed. Then he came back and drove away immediately. That's the reality of what happened that day. Three years later, in May 1945, Frank was caught by the US Army near his home in Munich. He had with him his diaries, 42 volumes, and a fantastic collection of artwork. And when I say fantastic, I mean fantastic. It included the portrait of Cecilia Gallerani, the lady with an ermine painted by Leonardo da Vinci in about 1489. The painting hung in Frank's home in the Vavel Castle in Krakow. Some of you may have seen it there or in London when it was the centerpiece of the Leonardo exhibit at the National Gallery. It is now back in Krakow and at the Vavel Castle. Nicholas Frank's son, uh, horse, uh, Hans Frank's son, Nicholas, who I have come to know, has told me that as a young boy, his father would make him stand before this painting and slick down his hair like Cecilia Gallerani. And the little boy, who was just five years old, was scared of the animal the lady was holding because he thought it was a rat. It is an ermine. But now, in 1945, Frank was in the dock, accused, charged for crimes against humanity and genocide. On the first day of the trial, the Soviet prosecutor took the judges to the events in the city of Lviv in the days and weeks following Frank's visit. The prosecutor described acts of murder and torture and ill treatment and called them the crime of genocide. More than 130,000 people killed in that period, more than 8,000 children murdered in just two months in the Yanovska camp at the heart of the city. As the words were spoken, Lauterpacht and Lemkin did not know whether those victims included their own families. Indeed, they were not yet aware that the man they were prosecuting, Hans Frank, was directly implicated in the murder of their own families. On this day, 20th of November 1945, for the first time ever, the terms genocide and crimes against humanity are used in a court of law. I knew that Lauterpacht and Frank were in the same room that day, and I wondered if a photograph existed. Lauterpacht's son, Eli, told me that there was no photograph, but rather, like my mother, I didn't believe him. A friend introduced me to the archives of Getty Images, the largest collection of images from that opening day of the trial, and I spent a full day going through hundreds of old glass plate images, each of which had to be taken out of its little protective paper sleeve. And finally, after many hours, I found the photograph that I was looking for from an unusual angle, different part of the courtroom. If you look carefully in the top left-hand corner, you will see Lauterpacht 
sitting with the British delegation, elbows on the table, hands clenched under his chin. He's attentive directly behind counsel's lectern at which a Soviet prosecutor is speaking. In the lower right-hand corner, you can see the large figure of Hermann Goering in his oversized light-colored suit move along the bench to the left, six along, and just before the image is cut off by the protruding balcony, the semi-bowed head of Hans Frank. Divided by no more than a few tables and chairs, Lauterpacht and Frank are together in the same room. The trial lasted for a full year, and judgment was handed down on September the 30th and October the 1st, 1946. We don't have time for me to reveal everything that transpired over the course of that remarkable year, as the lives of those three men became increasingly and remarkably intertwined. Suffice it to say, for me, the connections were entirely unexpected. A series of happenings which the historian Anthony Beaver has described as being of a kind that no novel could possibly match. The point that I'm making is that these personal journeys, these three men, coincided in ways that produced an outcome that changed the course of legal history and then the course of history itself. The ideas and endeavors of Lauterpacht and Lemkin influenced politics, history, culture, my life, and your lives. The concepts of crimes against humanity and genocide have entered our world, although many are under the impression they've existed since time immemorial. They have not. Both ideas are the product of creative and inventive minds. Two men driven by their own personal experiences forged on the anvil of a single city. Quite why Lauterpacht opted for the protection of the individual and what caused Lemkin to embrace the protection of the group is a matter of speculation. Their backgrounds were similar. They studied at the same university. Indeed, as I have discovered, they, have, they had the same teachers. If you want to trace the origins of these two crimes, you can trace them to Lemberg, to events at the end of the First World War, and to the law faculty. Indeed, you can trace them and the origins to a single teacher that the two men had in common, Professor Julius Makarevich, a Polish professor of criminal law. You can even follow the line to a particular building and to the very room where Makarevich shared his ideas with Lauterpacht and Lemkin on the treatment of individuals and groups, minorities. This is the classroom. It's still a working classroom today, and it still looks as it did 100 years ago. There's something else that strikes me as remarkable. Despite their common origins, common interests, and common journeys, and the fact that on occasion I've been able to locate Lauterpacht and Lemkin in the same city on the same day, although never in Nuremberg or courtroom 600, where they kept missing each other, sometimes by only a single day, it seems that Lauterpacht and Lemkin never actually met. But the concepts they put into international law inform my working life. And I frequently wondered how it could be that I ended up doing the work that I do. My quest to understand Lauterpacht and Lemkin was surely driven by my personal history in some way and by stories that had been buried away deep in family crypts, no doubt for the best of protective reasons. During that quest, I conducted much family detective work. I did manage to discover who Miss Tilney was and what she did, and I now understand why my mother and I and my brother have reason to be deeply grateful to a remarkable and courageous human being, a woman who was a missionary for the Surrey Chapel in Norwich, who was motivated by the sermons of her pastor, David Panton, and did as she did, saving people, because of a single line 
in chapter 10, verse 1 of Paul's letter to the Romans, a single line that motivated her to travel to Vienna in the summer of 1935 and save my mother's life. I also uncovered the identity of the man in the bow tie. That was an even longer journey, which took me east, then west, across rivers, across an ocean, through piles of old Austrian telephone dictories, uh, directories. I hired a private detective in Vienna, and it was finally Facebook that opened up the answer to the story. I shudder to say that, I'm afraid to say, but it's true. And I found myself in an attic in a small town called Massapequa, Long Island, where the owner of the house took out of an album this photograph, a photograph that unlocked another family mystery. A single image taken in a garden in Vienna, probably Brahmsplatz, in the spring of 1941. My grandmother with two men in white socks. Pause. I was unaware the first time I saw this photograph what the significance of the white socks was. But the white socks were banned by the governments of Dolphus and Schuschnigg in 34 and 35, and they symbolized affiliation with the Nazis. One of the man, the one on the right, was the man in the bow tie, and he was my grandmother's lover, although not actually a Nazi, but a secret hidden Jew. One discovery catalyzed another, and this took me to the identity of the man who was my grandfather's true love, his best friend, Max. Such efforts take many years, and there are many consequences from such stories. If you're going to have an affair, don't exclude the possibility that 70 years later, <laughs> one of your diligent grandchildren will be able to identify with absolute precision what happened. These are the requirements of an exercise in personal archaeological enterprise. I should say the story had a happy ending. My grandmother and my grandfather came back together and lived their lives uh, together as a couple in Paris. But perhaps even more remarkably, and even more unexpectedly, I learned of the more direct connections between my family and the Lauterpachs and the Lemkins. From this new material, I was able to discover that my great-grandmother, Amalia Buchholz, was born and lived in the small town of Zulkiev, just outside Lemberg. Those of you who have been attentive will recall from the earlier part of the lecture that this happens to be the same tiny town where Hirsch Lauterpacht was born. My great-grandmother and Hirsch Lauterpacht were born and lived on the very same street, just a few hundred meters apart. It was called Lemberger Straße back then. Coincidentally, or perhaps not, Lauterpacht's son and only child, Ellie, who some of you will know, was my first teacher in international law in 1982. He became my mentor. We did cases together in The Hague for 30 years. Only in 2014 did we learn that his father and my great-grandmother originated on the very same street in this small town outside Lemberg. That street was described by the great writer Joseph Roth as East-West Street, hence the title of the book. In the course of the research, I also discovered that Amalia, whose life began in the proximity to the Lauterpax, ended on the 23rd of September 1942 in the kingdom of Hans Frank. The last street that she walked down was Himmelfahrtstrasse, the street to heaven. It was the street that led from the railway platform to the gas chamber at the camp known as Treblinka. A month after she walked down that street, Lemkin's parents 
Bella and Joseph walked down exactly the same street and perished in the same gas chamber. My great-grandmother's life, Amalia, was caught in this curious way between the Lauterpax and the Lemkins. In a different way, my life, too, is bookended by their ideas. How does one begin to understand these points of connection? Of course, the starting point is the ideas of these two remarkable characters, Lauterpacht and Lemkin, and the enduring relevance of their ideas today. The relationship between the individual and the group has been contested across the ages. I was reminded of this when I came across a letter written by Lauterpacht to his son, Ellie, in the summer of 1946, as he was preparing a draft of the closing arguments to be delivered at Nuremberg by Sir Hartley Shawcross, the British Attorney General. Having recently learned that all but one member of his Lemberg family had been murdered, on the orders of Hans Frank, whom he was prosecuting, it must have been a time of intense anguish, personal grief, and professional challenge. To his son, he wrote that he managed to find solace in these most difficult of times and strength by listening to the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, and in particular, the Matthew Passion. Remarkably, at the very same moment, July 1946, Hans Frank told Dr. Gustav Gilbert, the US Army psychologist who was attending to the needs of the defendants, who recorded it in his diary, that at these most trying of times, as the trial reached its climax, he took refuge by imagining that he was listening to the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, and in particular, the Matthew Passion. How remarkable, I thought, that two men on opposite sides of the same courtroom should find solace in the same piece of music. I pause to say that I very much appreciate it in the context of this lecture, but also the book where music plays an important role, the wonderful trio that we heard uh, at the beginning of this fine uh, afternoon. So I immersed myself into the Matthew Passion. What is it really about? And I came to understand what I didn't know, the work's resonance for Lauterpacht, who was fluent in German. The libretto of the Matthew Passion reflected Bach's emphasis of a pietist belief in the fundamental role of the individual. Every aria but one in the Matthew Passion is sung as ich, I. And the three landmark choruses are sung in the first person plural. What Bach was doing was signaling the bypassing of the priest, celebrant, and the church, the group, allowing the individual a direct connection with God. For Frank, with his scathing disregard of the integrity of the individual, the connection is more difficult to understand, not least since the work is generally understood as a scathing attack on the Catholic faith to which he had converted just a year earlier following a failed suicide attempt. Lauterpacht believed that we should concentrate on the protection of the individual. And I'm sure he would argue even today that Lauterpacht's invention of the concept of genocide has been useless in practical terms and dangerous in political terms. Lauterpacht feared that the concept of genocide would replace the tyranny of the state with the tyranny of the group. And I have to say, in a certain way, my own practical work on genocide in courts at The Hague concords with that view. I've observed for myself how the focus on the protection of one group against another group tends to reinforce the sense of them and us. It tends to amplify the power of group identity and association, which is both a source of sustenance and danger. How does this happen? In seeking to prove that a genocide has occurred, in law you have to establish the existence and expression, as I mentioned, of an intent to destroy a group in whole or in part. I've seen for myself how that process tends to reinforce the sense of victimhood of the targeted group, 
and hatred towards the perpetrators as a mass, as a group. But of course, I also understand what Lemkin was trying to do. He was surely right to recognize a reality that in most, if not all, cases of mass atrocity, the targets are not individuals, but human beings who happen to be a member of a group that is hated at a moment in time and place. Lemkin would say, and it is a powerful argument, that the law must reflect that reality and it must recognize and give legitimacy to the feelings that most, if not all of us have of association with one or more groups. This profoundly strong sentiment was brought home to me recently. I wrote an article for the Financial Times magazine, a profile of a remarkable man, Dr. Jan Kisselhahn, a German psychologist who established the program to assist Yazidi women and girls who'd been enslaved, tortured, and serially raped by individuals associated with ISIS. He ran and organized the program to bring 1,100 of these young women and girls to Germany for medical and psychological treatment. In his work, Dr. Kisselhahn identified the connection between the possibility of justice and the future well-being of victims. Characterizing such atrocities as a genocide is, in Dr. Kisselhahn's view, vital as a first step. He welcomed the use of the word by the European Parliament and by the Obama administration in calling it a genocide. Calling it a genocide, he explained, recognizes the group's identity, recognizes what is being done to it, and tells members of the group they have the right to exist as a group. In his eyes, crimes against humanity or war crimes just doesn't do that, and it's not, therefore, enough. Nevertheless, I'm concerned about the hierarchy that seems to have emerged, one that puts genocide atop the list of horrors so that a mere crime against humanity or a war crime is seen somehow as a lesser evil. Call something a genocide and it's on page one of our newspapers. Call it a crime against humanity and if it makes it into the papers at all, it'll be on page 13. That is the power of the word invented by Raphael Lemkin, one that opens up the imagination. That perhaps too is the power of our association with the protection of the group. What then is the legacy, the enduring legacy of these two terms? There was quiescence after Nuremberg, five decades passed, and then everything was catalyzed open by the horrors of the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, by the arrest of Senator Pinochet, the creation of the International Criminal Court, the events of September the 11th and the actions that followed, taking us through Afghanistan, Iraq, and into the world of ISIS, and Yazidis and Syria, and the girls and women of whom I have made mention. The crime of genocide and the idea that each of us as individuals has rights under international law were entirely new in 1945. The moment of creation was significant, revolutionary, I would say, an act of recognition. The right of sovereignty over human beings and the exercise of that right is no longer unlimited. But the killings have not stopped. And today, once again, a poison of xenophobia and nationalism is coursing its way through the veins of our Europe and through many other parts of the world. The strong man as leader is back. I see it on my journeys to the central and eastern parts of the continent, to Hungary, to the Ukraine. Mention was made of the film My Nazi Legacy, directed by my dear friend David Evans, where I stood in a field watching people dressed in SS uniforms celebrating the creation of the Waffen-SS Galicia Division. That was July 2014. I've seen it too on my journeys in the making of The Rat Line, the podcast series. Traveling across Europe, in Austria, and Poland, and other places, it's hard to avoid what seems to be stirring, and I do wonder where this is going to lead to. The generation that experienced the horrors of the 1930s, and some of you are in this room today, knows why states came together after 1945 to create 
a United Nations, to adopt in Paris at the Palais de Chaillot in December 1948. In this room you can see the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the first modern human rights treaty, the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. That generation, that vital generation, knows why humanity did that. And with the disappearance of that generation, and perhaps the disappearance of actual memory, of actual experience, our politicians feel able to somehow take for granted that what occurred back then can never happen again. It is impossible for me not to have gone through the experience of writing East West Street and the projects that have followed, an immersion in the world of the years between 1914 and 1945, and not feel an acute sense of anxiety as to what is stirring. Two years ago, Mr. Trump, as a candidate, called for a total and complete shutdown for Muslims entering the United States. Those are his words. The idea of targeting people, not because of their individual propensities, because of what they have done as individuals, but simply because they happen to be a member of a particular group, has a long, dark history. That's why we are gathered here today. You know it in Amsterdam, you know it in the Netherlands, as other people around the world know it too. The writer Primo Levi, who spent a year as an involuntary resident of a place called Auschwitz, put the point very crisply in the preface to his book, If This Is a Man, published in 1947. He wrote, and I quote, many people, many nations, can find themselves holding, more or less wittingly, that every stranger is an enemy. When this happens, he continued, when the unspoken dogma becomes the major premise in a syllogism, then at the end of the chain, there is the concentration camp. One thing leads to another. Against this background, the idea of a travel ban based on a person's nationality or religion is deeply troubling. Experience, recent experience, teaches us to know where such a beginning can lead, singling out people not for what they might have done, but because they happen to be a member of a particular group. Closer to my home, it's possible also to smell a change in the air, a sharp move to identity politics. Two years ago, Theresa May, as Prime Minister, told her party conference that if you believe you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. She's indicated too that if she could, she would take the United Kingdom out of the European Convention on Human Rights. How incredible and appalling is that? One former London mayor, Ken Livingstone, offensively evoked Adolf Hitler as a supporter of Zionism. Another former London mayor, Boris Johnson, so I'm sorry to say, who got two years as foreign secretary, suggested that the European Union and Adolf Hitler somehow share common aims. Brexit and Trump are surely a reflection of a new direction. That's the context in which I oscillate between the views of Lauterpacht and Lemkin, between the individual and the group, between the realism of Lemkin and the idealism of Lauterpacht. I can see the force of both arguments and recognize the struggle between the individual and the group, between crimes against humanity and genocide, a struggle that will not soon be resolved. And that's why international law today embraces both concepts. But we are at a dangerous moment. Many of our politicians seem not to be able to recognize how incredibly precious was the settlement of 1945 and how vulnerable is the acquis that was created, one that has offered a foundation for international relations in our time. We cannot take for granted what was achieved back then. The threat to the multilateral global order and to the rights of individuals and groups is a real one. That the challenge is led by its principal founder, the United States, under its current administration, is a matter of real concern. 
that the United Kingdom chooses to remain mostly silent, devoured as it is by the short-term quest for possible future trade agreements in the aftermath of a likely but not yet inevitable Brexit speaks very loudly. Equally, there are positive developments. Efforts are underway, led by the United Nations International Law Commission, to prepare a new convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity to fill a much needed gap alongside the Genocide Convention. There's also a great deal of new thinking on how we better enforce what we already have. And of course, in Paris recently, there was celebrated the adoption 70 years ago of the Universal Declaration and the Genocide Convention. These are the contexts then in which I closed East West Street. For those of you who've read it, you will recall I was at a mass grave, a long ago site of mass killing, caught between different poles, between my head and my heart, between intellect and instinct, recognizing the need to, to, to value the inherent worth of every human being, yet understanding also the pull of tribal loyalty, the essential truth of the notion that we are indeed, each of us, haunted by the gaps left within us by the secrets of others, but also by the possibility that the discovery of such a haunting will not necessarily destroy us, but could actually make us stronger, may actually permit us to proclaim loud and clear Auschwitz never again. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>